Hello. Good, e good evening, everybody. My name is, uh, is Roger Bills. I'm the curator of, uh, or the senior curator at uh, the South African Institute uh, for Aquatic Biodiversity in Wakanda, Grahamstown. Um, I'm here to introduce Dr. Dave Ebert tonight to uh, give us a talk uh, titled Beyond Jaws, Rediscovering South Africa's Lost Sharks. Um, before I do that, I want a, a couple of uh, housekeeping issues. Uh, if you have questions, we intend to ask Dave at the end uh, of the uh, talk uh, a series of questions. Please, can you post the questions into the Q&A section uh, at the bottom of your, uh, of, your, of your screen. If you're on uh, Facebook, then please can you post, uh, post your questions into the comments. And then all being well, these will get filtered through to me and I will ask Dave these at the end of the session. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dave, uh, Dr. Dave Ebert. He, he works at um, the uh, Moss Landing Laboratories in California, but Dave's association with um, South Africa started uh, in the mid 1980s with, um, with a PhD in uh, Rhodes University in Grahamstown. He then followed that up with a, um, a postdoc at the Cape Town, Universe, uh, Cape Town Museum, now Ezeco, uh, both of those under the mentorship of uh, Dr. Len Campagno. Dave has since then um, published a, quite an astonishing number of publications, over 600 publications, over 300 research, peer-reviewed research papers, 30 books, and a, um, I think he's described over 50 new shark species. Dave's accomplishments are, are, are actually too numerous to mention, but he, he currently serves as the president of the you, uh, American Elasmobranch Society. He serves on the IUCN's shark specialist group. And um, it, in accordance with his associations with Grahamstown and SIAB, um, he also is our Chondrichthian curator and he helps us manage our Chondrichthian collections uh, in a variety of ways. Most recently, uh, Dave has published uh, a paper on the checklist, an annotated checklist of the sharks of South Africa, together with Sabine Wintner and Peter Kine. And, and that was the impetus for us inviting Dave to, to give uh, a talk about South African sharks. And so um, I will hand over to Dave. Welcome. Great, thanks. Thanks, Roger, I appreciate that. And it's great to um, be here, kind of my own home uh, stomping grounds is much as I can be, as much as I can be here in person virtually, and um, anyway, it's always great. I just love love having the opportunity to talk to uh, uh, groups, especially on my sort of uh, uh, favorite topics on South African sharks. And it's great having a largely uh, South African uh, uh, audience today. So let me find this sharing thing here and get that up and going. Let's see here. Uh, does that look, come out okay, Roger? It, uh, David, if you can swap swap displays. Well, okay. Uh, hang on, just a second. Uh, let's see, sharing. Yeah. Hang on, I can't. I can't find the sharing here. It's not sharing. Swap displays button at the top. There we go. On the left. On the left. Yeah. Cool. There we go. Sorry about that. Technical Perfect. Technical. There we go. Oh, cool. well, great. Anyway, thanks. Thanks again. I, I want to thank thank uh, Syab and SciFest for hosting uh, my presentation today. I've been I've been looking looking for this quite a bit. Looking for this quite a bit. And um, yeah, so a lot of this came off this recent paper I did, which was an as Roger mentioned, was an annotated checklist of of the sharks of of South Africa. But in order to really start talking about the South Africa's biodiversity, you kind of need to look at the history and sort of the people that kind of laid the foundation for shark research in South Africa. And, and many of you may not know, but South Africa has, has an over 200 year history really of shark research. In fact, a question I'm just gonna kind of pose out there at the start is, 
if any of you have any idea what the first shark that was named in South Africa or the year is, you can message to Roger on the Q&A section and, I'll, and I'll, I'll give you the answer here in a few minutes. Um, but the thing is a lot of the early shark research was really about documenting more of what occurred in Cape waters as well as, as well as for fisheries purposes. So there wasn't really any direct uh, research onto sharks until, until really until about the 1960s when you had these sort of these pioneers really in, in shark research that really kind of laid the groundwork, the foundation for where shark research has come today in South Africa. And the thing is, a lot of these people here, and if you don't know who these people are, they, they've, they've published a number of publications through the Oceanographic Research Institute, through the South African Museum. Um, but you should know who these people are, particularly for South Africa, because these are the people that really kind of laid the foundation and you know, as pioneers. And if you actually look at the end of our pa my paper, we, we actually acknowledge them as it, it, I dedicated the paper to them for their pioneering research. And think about being, being pioneers like these individuals here is it's really, it's, it can be kind of almost like a metaphor for life because it's really about the, the, the road you choose, the path you decide to take. And the question is, you know, do you choose a path of, a, of, a, of an explorer or a settler? And I say explorer is also in reference to a pioneer. And I pose this because, because if you're an explorer or a pioneer, the first thing you really need to understand is that, you know, following the herd or swim with the school is not what's really gonna set you apart. It requires you to think outside the box. And, you know, cause it's not a well-traveled road. There's no compass, no GPS, or not even a map, but the road could hold the most surprise along the way. And it might be the most rewarding journey you take. So with that mindset, with that sort of mindset thing in mind, I wanna start talking about a shark that probably everyone in South Africa is familiar and that's the great white shark. Now you can hardly flip on a TV program, certainly here in the States, you know, whether it's uh, National Geographic or Shark Week or, or BBC without them showing some spectacular image of, of white sharks breaching usually in, in False Bay out around Seal Island. And it's pretty spectacular if you haven't seen it, it certainly is. Um, but really, but, but South Africa has, has like the fifth most diverse shark fauna around there. And yet you would talking to people, you would think they only, there's only one shark that anybody recognizes. And, and when I kind of started doing shark research back in the 1980s, really the first, you know, white, we really didn't know much about white sharks. And you could say even today that we still don't know really a lot about, about white sharks today, but we know a lot more than we did say 30, 40 years ago. And, and, and most of you may know this, but you know, South Africa was actually the first country in the world to actually de implement some uh, policies to, uh, for conservation and, and, and protection for the white shark. And that was back in 1990, 91. And I was kind of fortunate as I was still in South Africa at the time. And I had a, they will have a little bit of role in that uh, through my advisor, Leonard Campagno, providing information to sea fisheries and for other uh, policymakers at the time. So it was, it was a pretty dynamic time um, to be there and to be to be working on sharks, and it, it still is today. But with with, with people don't when they think about like things like the white shark and stuff, you know, you got to realize there's actually a lot of other species going on. Even though there's there's a uh, um, there's these, these sharks that are there, but people don't often think about some of these other species of sharks, such as such as like something like now whale shark. You could maybe make a, 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 a an argument that is somewhat iconic. But unlike you know, something like a white shark or a tiger shark or a Zambezi or bull shark, which gets a lot more attention because of the occasional times that there are shark attacks, you know, whale sharks are, 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 more, are more passive, they're plankton feeders, but they are the largest fish in the world and they are rather distinctive in the fact they have this sort of large checkerboard pattern. And here's kind of an interesting uh, little trivial thing for, for many of you out there, but how many of you actually would know that the whale shark which was described in 1828 was actually based on the first specimen which came from Table Bay on the West Coast. Now the fact that it came from South Africa is pretty exciting, but the fact that it was from, from, the, from the West Coast in a more cooler temp, cooler water, I think was quite amazing. And it was Andrew Smith who, who actually first, first described that and said back in 1828. So that's kind of a cool thing that the biggest fish in the world was actually, was actually, named, from, was actually named on a specimen from South Africa. Now, also we have like, you have like, say things, something like the whale shark, which gets nearly 20 meters actually. But on the other end of the spectrum, you have what's called a small spined pygmy shark, which doesn't get much bigger than the palm of your hand. And a lot of people don't even recognize these things as, 
as actually a shark, as an actual shark. They're, so, they're such a small species. And the small spine pygmy shark is one of about four or five, six species that kind of are competing for the world's smallest shark. There's a few of them. Some people might say it's a ribbon tail cat shark, or there's a few others, but it's certainly in the, at, the, at the smaller end of the range. You also have things like the cookie cutter shark, which gets only about you know, 50, 60 centimeters in length. And it's actually, and that's actually a parasitic species. And, and I say parasitic in that it has these sort of large sectoral lips and that it has, it has actually the largest teeth of any shark in the world. And that includes, includes the white shark. Now, obviously the white shark has very large triangular teeth, but, but relative to the size of the body, the white shark teeth are not that large. But with the, with the, with the cookie cutter shark, they actually they, they have the largest teeth. And what they do is they go up to like whales or dolphins or tunas or billfish. And, and, and take like a little plug scoop bite out of, out of them is how they feed. And there actually have been a couple of instances of them attacking people out in the open ocean. There was recently, I think about eight years ago, there was somebody swimming in open ocean, swim between the Hawaiian, a couple of the Hawaiian islands at night and was actually bit twice, uh, once in the chest and once in the calf by one of these things. Now, of course, in my mind, I'm thinking like, why is somebody swimming between the Hawaiian islands in the middle of the night? That's kind of seems strange to me, but um, then anyway, but that just gives you a sense of some of the diversity. Now, when people think of sharks, they tend to think of something that's sort of like, you know, gray or black or kind of a uniform color. Nobody thinks of a shark being pink with blue fins. And if you see, ever have the opportunity to see a goblin shark, these things are actually, when you first see them, are actually a pinkish color with blue fins. And I was kind of fortunate, the first record of a goblin shark actually from South Africa came from off Cape Columbine in the 1960s. And I was kind of fortunate because I think the second record came in about 1988. There was a specimen caught off Cape Columbine, or excuse me, not Cape Columbine, off of Port Shepstone on the East Coast and was brought up to Orion. Myself and Paul Cowley, one of our grad students at the time, had an opportunity to go up and examine it. But it's only been known, this is a shark species, it's only been known from a few specimens off, off South Africa. There's other parts of the world you can see them quite readily. Um, but again, it's kind of that give you a sense of the variety of sharks that are out there. And of course, here's a species that if you do any diving or fishing, especially in the Cape waters, you might see. And that's, this, and that's this little shy shark here. And they obviously get their names because if you go up and you disturb them in the kelp forest, they'll kind of curl up and put their, put their uh, uh, fin over their eyes and they'll be kind of shy. Of course, they're probably not super happy. Um, the scientific name for this species is Apple Bluff or said words the eye. And we frequently call them like, refer to them as happy eddies. And again, if, and, and the interesting thing with this shark is it's endemic only to South Africa. And it's one of about 15 or 16 species that are only known from South Africa water, South African waters, which is pretty incredible. I think you think about you have this, you have a number of species, and most of this genus actually only occurs, only occurs in South African waters. So that's pretty, that's a pretty cool, pretty cool to think about. Another species, kind of again, sort of along the diversity line of diversity, is this is called a tail, a tail-like shark. Now, this was a species that was caught off Cape Town in 1966. And it was the, it was actually not only a new shark, but it was a new genus of shark and was described by Butch Hulley at the time. And what's really interesting about this shark, and if you've been following the news at all, there's been some information in the news about uh, glowing sharks that glow in the dark. And it was based on a paper out of New Zealand on uh, seal sharks, kite fin, or, or call, also called kite fin sharks, which do occur off South Africa. But this shark actually secretes a, a bioluminescent fluid from, from some glands located near the cloaca. And again, this is a shark that doesn't get much bigger than the palm of your hands. And the only record of this species came from off Cape Town, as I mentioned in 1966. And since that time, there was a couple, there was a specimen taken off Brazil in 1980, and then two more that were caught off uh, Chile in about 2008. And, those, and this shark's only known from these four specimens ever. And as I say, it turned out it was, a, it was turned out as an entirely new genus of shark. But it's pretty cool because the actual holotype original description also came from off South Africa. Now, most sharks have five gill slits on each side of their head. In fact, no, no sharks have less than five, but there are a few species, there's actually eight species that have six paired gills, and there's two species that have that have 10, that, excuse me, that have seven paired gill slits. No, no, none have more than seven. And also, and here's one of them. This is this is this is the uh, uh, African saw shark, Plyotrema warrenii. It was a species that was described from South Africa. And as you can see, it has like a very long, 
saw-like rostrum. Now, people think when they see something like this, you know, they think they sometimes confuse it with a sawfish. Now, sawfish is a different is a is a bit of a different different organism. It's a ray, actually, which I'll talk about those in just a moment. But with with the with the saw the difference between the saw shark and a saw fish is a saw shark, as you can see, has the gills in the side of its head versus underneath versus underneath its head, which saw fish have. An interesting thing about this, besides the, the rostrum, which kind of gives again show highlights the diversity of sharks just in general, but certainly within South African waters. Uh, and interestingly, this is a species that again, as I said, was described from South Africa. It was most common on the Agulhas Bank. But also was until recently was thought to occur up to uh, Tanzania and Kenya and out to Madagascar. But recently, a colleagues of mine, uh, Simon Vagman and some and some collaborators, Ofer Gong at Siab, uh, recognized that there's actually two additional species in this genus. And so what we have now is that the species that we thought was this from Madagascar is actually a new species that was just described last year that's endemic to Madagascar. And there's another there's another a third species that we only know from Zanzibar, which is pretty interesting. So what, what, from a conservation standpoint, this species just went from occurring in a rather broad area from Zanzibar, possibly Kenya to South Africa. And now, now, it's, now we know this thing mainly occurs in South, Af just in South Africa. There's a couple records from Southern Mozambique. And there is actually one record from Southern Namibia that I recently became aware of. Um, but it's, it's interesting that like, of the eight species of six gill sharks out there, because there's two larger species in a different genus, Hexanchus, four, four of the six species occur in South, a four of the eight species occur in South African waters and six of the eight are, are occur in East Africa. So, so I talked about sharks, but a lot of times people don't recognize these as sharks and these are the rays. And I find, you know, the rays include things like the skates, the stingrays, the guitar fish, and I oftentimes refer to these when I'm speaking to general audiences as flat sharks. Now, you know, obviously if you're talking to other ichthyologists, you, you know, you'll say rays, it might refer to rays or guitar fish, but when you're talking to general public, I find if you refer to, if I refer to them as flat sharks, it gets people's attention more. And because, and from the conservation concerns, which I'll talk a little more about for some of these species, you know, trying to get people excited or interested in these things, it kind of helps from a, almost like a branding standpoint to refer to them refer to them as a flat shark. And these really are sharks. So they are, if you think of a shark and you flatten the shark and you, and you have the gills underneath its head, that's really what a ray is. It's just, it really is just a flat shark. And so I oftentimes refer to these things as flat sharks when I'm speaking to, to, to a general audience, because a lot of times it's important, especially the, those of you that are scientists out there listening today or researchers, it's important when you speak to a general audience to like, con, you know, use terms and phrases that they, you can connect with them. And this species here is actually one of the last, one of the most recent new species described from South Africa. This is Austin's guitar shark, which was, which I named in 2017. It was one of five new species from South Africa that was just named, that was just named in, in, in 2017. Now, this is another type of shark. It's called a ghost shark. It's also referred to as a chimera, a ratfish, or St. Joseph's. And it's, it's a species, it's also related in the sharks in that what unites the sharks and the flat sharks and the ghost sharks is, the, is they all have a cartilaginous skeleton, whereas most fish species have, have a bony skeleton. And again, if I, and I know this from having done a lot of research on these things, is that if you use the term chimera ratfish, uh, nobody hardly pays any attention to them. But if you use the term ghost shark, people get excited. They get more interested in them because of that connection with a shark. Now this species here, this is Robin's ghost shark. This is, comes from the, some of the seamount seamounts off South Africa and in the Southeast Atlantic and Southwest Indian Ocean. And this was another species that was just described, I described with one of my grad students in 2017. And it's one of about eight species of ghost sharks that occur in South African waters. Now, a question I get frequently and people ask me is like, well, that's pretty cool, Dave. We didn't realize there was a lot of different sharks out, there's so many out there. And I'll, and I'll, so I'll pose the question, like, well, how many sharks do you think are out there? And sometimes people will throw out the question, like say, oh, maybe 20 or 30 or 50 or, or 100 sometimes. But if I tell people like, well, there's 1,250 species or more of sharks, it just blows their mind. And when I talk and when I term, use the term shark, I'm also including the flat sharks and, and, the, and, the, and the ghost sharks. And, and to put in perspective, what you think of as true sharks, 
there's about 540 species or so of what you would typically think of sharks. Whereas with the rays, the, the flat sharks, there's 670 species and growing. And it's actually a more diverse, it's actually a more diverse group of sharks than actually what you think of are the true sharks. So when people hear that number about like, wow, there's really a lot of shark species out there. I have, I have people ask me a, a question is like, well, have we discovered everything that's out there? Now, the answer is, well, no, there's actually, we haven't discovered everything out there. And if you look at this sort of chart here, going back to, from, 18, from 1758 to 1899, over 141 year period, there was on average about three sharks described a year. Then between, but between 1900 and 1979, there was on average about five sharks described a year. However, in the last 40 years, we've described almost on average of about 11 new species a year. So no, we haven't described, discovered everything. And there's a lot more new species out there still to be discovered. Now, these are obviously global numbers that I'm giving you. But if you actually look in the last 15 years, we're averaging almost 16 new species a year. And as I mentioned, just recently in 2017, there was five new species of sharks added, added to the fauna. Now, I asked, I asked some people, I asked the, kind of the outset of my talk, I posed the question, does anybody know what was the first shark named from South Africa? And Roger, do we have any guesses out there? Anybody know? Yes, Dave, we've got a, a couple, of, um, couple of people, three people have suggested that they are uh, whale sharks, that it was a whale shark. And one person, Aaron Judah, uh, said a pajama shark, Poroderma. Okay, did, they, did anybody give a year they think it was described? Any of these were described? Uh, I think, um, yes, Aaron gave, oh, 1700s. He wasn't sure of the date, but it was roughly there. Uh, okay, well, you can, you, can give him, you can give him a gold star. It was, uh, it was the pajama shark, which was described in, in 1789, which was the first shark described from South Africa. And, uh, and the, um, just a couple of the other ones, I believe the um, shy shark was described in 1822 and then the whale shark in 1828. And so I might've missed one or two, but the pajama shark was the first shark described from South African waters in 1789. And it kind of gives you an idea of just, again, how kind of the long history of, 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 of shark research that's gone on in South, in South Africa. And again, it's something I always try to, especially come into such a wonderful place, you know, people should be, should be aware of your history. Now, one of the things I, I tease a little bit online and social media. And one of the things I wanted to, was going to want to reveal today was the next new shark. And I mentioned there, the last new sharks described from South Africa were in 2017. Well, in the next few weeks, there's going to be another new shark coming out that's going to be in the genus Edmopterus, and it's going to be referred to as Barry's lantern shark. Now, this picture here I'm showing you, this is actually a white cheek lantern shark that I described with, with Rob Leslie and Simon Vagman and and Nico Straub about five years ago. I didn't want to put up the picture of the shark just yet because it hasn't been it hasn't been published yet. But it'll be in the it'll be out in a few weeks. And the shark and the lantern. But this is the genus and similar to what the shark that that the new, next newest shark uh, from South Africa to be named. And we named it Barry's lantern shark after Barry Rose, who's a good friend and colleague of ours. And uh, Barry is one of the one of the best naturalists that I I probably knew when I was in South Africa. And he's a very, he was a keen, he was also one of the keen birders, one of the top birders around there. Really good friends. He worked at Sea Fisheries for many years. Then he later went on and worked for INJ and, and Barry, and he, was, and he also was a very keen fisherman. Barry sadly passed away a few years ago. And Rob and I wanted to kind of recognize sort of Barry's friendship and his contributions to the natural history of, of a lot of the South African fishes and just wildlife in general. And so the next few weeks on my social media, I'll be posting this as soon as it's officially published. But I wanted to share that with you today because I haven't, we've kind of kept this quite secret and haven't told anybody about this just yet. So anyway, that's kind of a, one of the things I've been wanting to kind of share with everybody. So one of the things that people come up and they think about <clears throat> um, when I talk about, when I talk about a lot of these little sharks and these are, and these, a lot of these, again, these little, lot, these little sharks I talk to, or I say little sharks, but these sort of non-charismatic species that I, I, as I refer to as the lost sharks, people think, well, that's kind of cool, Dave. There's a lot of these, like, there's such good diversity out there, you know, but why should we care? Well, 
you think about think about it in terms of these these iconic species, you know, things like lions or elephants or gorillas, polar bears, you know, or the white shark would fall into this category. Now, there's entire conservation organizations dedicated to preserving these things to ensure that they don't go extinct or anything. However, you know, while there's a lot of focus placed in these iconic species, there's a lot of these sort of, again, I refer to as these lost sharks that are disappearing right before our eyes with almost no recognition. For example, if I mentioned to you a Pondicherry shark, this is a species that occurs in the Northern Indian Ocean. It was described off Pondicherry, India in 1839. We haven't seen this species since the 1970s. Now, this is a, this is a small shark species. It doesn't get much more than a meter in length. It's a coastal species and occurs in areas that are in, subject to intensive fisheries. And these are things that are just that, you know, are disappearing right, right before our eyes. And, and why everybody focuses on the white shark, there's almost nobody paying any attention to these types of species. Here's another example. This is the missing speckled cat shark. This was a species that was, that was discovered and named off Somalia in 1972. We haven't seen this species since 1991. And, and again, this is an area that's a species that's been subject to a lot of intense fisheries. And I might note the speckled cat shark was, just, when it was described in 1972, it was described by Stuart Springer, who is a well-known uh, shark uh, researcher in North America, and Jeanette Daubry from South Africa. And just kind of a comment on her is that Jeanette actually described four new species of sharks uh, from South Africa. And keep in mind, this is back in the 1970s where it wasn't, you know, there was still, you know, kind of taxonomy and shark research was kind of new. And it's just kind of a little side note there is that she was, she was kind of a contemporary of Eugenie Clark, who was a well-known um, uh, researcher, ichthyologist in North America. And like with the, and so they're kind of contemporaries, but if you look at like, you know, Jeannie's contributions, which are certainly numerous. And you look at Jeanette's, they were very comparable at their time. As they say, they were contemporary. They were contemporaries. So again, just something about knowing a bit about the history and some of the people that, that, that have kind of laid the foundation here for the current research in South Africa. And coming closer to home in South Africa, there's a species called a, a missing honeycomb cat shark. Now, this was a species that we really haven't seen since 1972. It wasn't officially named uh, until, until 2006, and that was by Brett Human, 34 years after it appeared to have disappeared. Now, in the last few days while I was preparing this talk, I've had some lively back and forth with Rob Leslie and Sean Fennessy and a few other uh, <clears throat> old friends uh, about this species. And there might be a couple records of this thing either in 2007 or 2010. And so, and that's kind of, to me, that, this is the stuff that gets me excited something that we haven't seen in decades. And, and I, could, I could spend a whole hour just talking about one species after another globally that we haven't seen, um, that we knew used to be common. And this species was common at one time in the shrimp fisheries. And so we're actually, I'm actually uh, been corresponding with Sean and, and Rob, seeing if we can find some more recent records of this thing. But this is the kind of thing that's disappearing, that's disappearing. And people think like, well, okay, so, we're, so some of these sharks are disappearing. Well. Why again, why is this important? Well, if you think about these, these are like the proverbial canary in the coal mine. You know, people back in the day before you had more modern te technology, people would lower a canary down into a coal mine and then leave it down there for a few minutes and pull it up. And if the canary was alive, it was safe to go down there. If it was dead, it meant things were, it meant the, the gas wasn't, wasn't breathe, the air down there wasn't breathable. Well, these are the species that are disappearing. And that by the time you get up to where you recognize something like a white shark, that may, that may be disappearing. There's probably a whole bunch of things that have ha occurred in the environment below that. And so I try to stress, you know, that some of these, again, these lesser known, these lost sharks are things you should pay attention to because they're gonna tell you more about the environment than, than oftentimes in the white shark well and a more, or a more charismatic species. So <laughs> a fun question I get a lot of times is people ask me like, you know, well, where do you find these lost sharks, Dave? And, you know, I've and say I've, my whole career has been basically looking around trying to find these different species. And it's not necessarily all these new species. A lot of times it's range extensions, people that didn't realize that certain species occurred in an area. <clears throat> and the, the different areas that you can find these things is quite, is quite dramatic in that, for example, well, now this is a sperm whale, but... <clears throat> How many people out there knew that the first record of, of a velvet dog shark, Zamias squamulosis, came from the stomach of a, of a sperm whale that had been harpooned off Durban in 1971? 
And for those of you younger people may not know this, but, but there used to be a whaling station out of Durban that operated for many years until, the, until whaling was banned. But the first records of this, of this one shark came from a whale that they came in off Durban again. And we didn't, and this, these were the only records of this species for many years. And it wasn't really until the late 1980s when myself and Leonard Capano and Paul Cowley and a few others were going out in Africana doing surveys, we started finding this shark obviously uh, on the West and South coast. And now we you know this thing's pretty well, it does occur there if, you, if you're in the right area. But this is just an example of, of some of the interesting ways things might show up. <clears throat> Another thing is one species, a long nosed pygmy shark, for example, which was an entirely new genus of shark. It was found on a beach in Durban near the pier in 1923. It was formally named in, in 1934. Now this is this species is this long-nosed pygmy shark. This is the only record of this shark we have from South Africa. And it's only known from a few specimens in the world. There was a couple off Ascension Island and one off Chile. And but the first record of this thing, this entirely new genus to the world, came off South Africa. And it was because somebody found this thing laying on a beach in 1923. And it's the only record, but it tells you, it also emphasizes how little we know about a lot of the shark species <clears throat> that occur, like, you know, again, just like in your own backyard there. Another, another way <laughs> I've had sharks, i found sharks is sometimes they show up in the mail. And I literally, when I was working on a species about 10 years ago called the Cape Chimera, Chimera Note Africana with a former student of mine, Jenny Kemper, um, a lot, when you're describing a new species, you need to look at comparative material. So we borrowed a, we asked, a museum, um, and this was in the United States, if we could borrow uh, some specimens for a comparison. And one of the specimens that showed up in the mail was an entirely new species of chimera. So we ended up actually getting a two for one. And that species became known as chimera bahamaensis or the Bahamas chimera from off the, from, it's the only known chimera from the Bahamas. But again, you just never know where things show up. And, you know, of course, you're probably wondering like, well, what about going out on research boats? And you know why, and, and yeah, and certainly when I was certainly in South Africa, I used to go out on the Africana quite a bit. I spent to some cruises on the Mary Nadi and some of the other boats there. And it's great, there's nothing like being out at sea to find things. Um, but, but you know, the thing is when you're, at, when you're at sea and you're on a boat, you know, you're only one person at sea on one boat. But when you go to fish markets or landing sites, you literally can have like a hundred boats a day coming in. And so your chances of finding things often goes, goes up quite sig significantly by looking around. And so, and this is a picture of myself and Rhett Bennett and Zanzibar wandering through some of the fish markets, which is like one of my favorite things to do. And, and so, so you, I, you find things, I find the fish markets or fish landing sites are some of the best places to go to actually find, th find a lot of these species. Now, the other cool thing I've really enjoyed, and again, I've done this, done this all over the world, all over Asia, South America, and of course, and of course of Africa. But one of the things that I also find interesting from going through these are also, are also some of the people you meet. And this is a young man I met in Zanzibar, Hamish, and he was, he's actually was a grad student at the university there. Now, a lot of times, and this guy happened to just be going around looking, he was trying for his thesis project, he was going around trying to identify sharks, and we didn't even, didn't, you know, and, and we didn't, no one really knew that anybody else was doing this, and I just sort of met him at the fish market, and we had a great time talking, he was showing me a lot of images, I was trying to help him identify some of the species he didn't know, and, um, and but, but people like this, or people like the fishermen, if you ever want to learn about what's really going on, talk to the fishermen, because these, those guys, even though they may not have formal education, they're like the most, the fisher knowledge is, is amazing because these guys, they know when to go out, the, the, the right weather conditions, the tides, and when they'll catch certain things. And I've, ha I've had some, some amazing experiences. I had an experience a couple of years ago, I was in Sri Lanka, and, and a, a colleague of mine had sent me this picture of this shark that I, I, go, I, I looked at and I recognized, I go, okay, I think this is a new species I've been looking for. And so I went, ended up going to Sri Lanka several months later, and uh, my colleagues there, I was, I, was, I was collaborating with Daniel Fernando and his group. I said, let's go to this one fish market where I think they're bringing in some deep sea sharks. And so we went there and they did have a deep sea fishery there. And I showed some fishermen the picture of the shark and the guys kind of nodded their head and they said, yeah, okay, great. We'll come back tomorrow. And I was like, okay, I'll come back tomorrow. Well, I came back the next day and it turned out that they brought one in. And this, again, this was an entirely new shark and it was basically off a picture. And of course, 
the cool thing now is you have a cell, a cell phone or a camera phone. You can show somebody a picture on it. And I asked this guy, I said, this fisherman, I said, do you catch these very often? And he says, well, we caught three yesterday. We just threw them back because they're not really worth anything. And, and so here I get this whole shark from just showing a guy a picture and asking him about it. The other interesting part of the story is you find out more about what's going on with some of the fisheries. And like this, using the Sri Lanka example, it turned out this, this fishery for deep sea sharks had just started only the past, in the past two or three years. And it was basically they were, they were fishing these sharks for their squalene oil. And this shark didn't happen to have a lot, doesn't have a lot high content of squalene, so they just throw them back. But it turned out this was a fishery that nobody in Sri Lanka was even aware of because unless you were there at this right particular time when they come in, you have no idea that there's even, it was even a fishery going on. And there's places in Africa, the same thing. You go up to a lot of the, you know, not, not, maybe not as much in South Africa, but you go up to some of the other countries. And a lot of times you, these landing zones, they'll bring in the sharks and stuff and they'll offload them and they're gone. So getting to know the fishermen or getting to know the people in the community is really important. And I've just found this just to be an amazing experience myself, being able to, 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 to talk to, to talk to people and to talk to local people like this, this young man here, Hamish. <clears throat> so <clears throat> a question I often get when I give talks is people, you know, they ask me like a question, the question they ask me is like, well, how did I do it? You know, how can, how can I find, how can I find something that, that's passionate, that's something that I want to do that I really enjoy doing? And, you know, it's actually one of my, one of my favorite questions to talk about or to answer, to answer people. And so I, I, I tell people like, and, and many of you are in the field have a similar story is that when I was about five years old, my parents gave me a book on sharks and I actually still have, have the book. And, and I was just amazed at these things. I thought they were the coolest things I'd ever seen. Now, you know, you're five years old, you're thinking, you know, you're thinking like, well, okay, dinosaurs, sharks, whales, you're always, you know, you're, you're five, you'll grow out of this stuff. But when I was about 10, I was still fascinated with sharks and I, and I was still, I still thought these were the coolest things I'd ever seen. Now, my parents, you know, they figure, well, he's 10, he'll grow out of this thing. Well, in my mind, I decided, you know, I wanted to go out. I wanted to travel the world. I wanted, I wanted to study sharks. And I wanted to figure out some way to get paid for it. So I went about, you know, going through school, went to high school. And, and you know, and when it, like my high school guidance counselor would mention something to me about what I wanted to do. I'm telling, well, I'm going to travel in the world and study sharks. And he'd kind of say, oh, that's nice. That's a nice day. But what's, what's going to be your plan B? And well, I really didn't have a plan B because I had this focus in life that I wanted to pursue. And I went on, I went, did my undergraduate degree at Humboldt State. And at that point, as I was finishing up my degree, I was just happy to finally be getting a degree. Well, first I was happy to even get into college, um, let alone finishing my degree. And at that point I was thinking, okay, now I'm ready to go travel the world. Well, a professor I had there pulled me aside one day and we went and had a cup of coffee. And he asked me, he said, what's your plans when you finish up? And I said, told him what I wanted to do, study sharks. And he said, well, you know, Dave, that's really cool and stuff, but you know, you really need to think about getting a master's degree. And I'm thinking like a master's degree. It's like, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just happy to be getting a bachelor's degree because I wasn't exactly the sharpest tool in the shed. And um, my, um, and you know, nobody in my family had ever been to grad school. So it was, it was like, it was like being an explorer, a pioneer. It was, you know, to going off in the unknown to go to grad, to thinking about going to grad school. So after I kind of, so I thought, okay, well, I, I better look into this grad school thing. So I did some research and I found a, at, you know, Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, which coincidentally was only a few miles from where I grew up in, in the Monterey area. Uh, Greg Kaye, the professor in ichthyology, they were starting, had just was starting up a shark program. Now, something that people, Oftentimes, when they think about the movie Jaws, which is where, which is where, you know, the, the, the white shark got a lot of notoriety, they tend to give it a, a, a kind of a negative connotation. And I kind of find it funny, especially younger people that weren't even around at that time. I mean, I was, I was in high school when the movie came out. And it was kind of a cool movie, you know, very, very suspenseful. It was a horror movie, but rather than, than the negative connotation, what really came out of that movie was people got interested in sharks. And even though shark attacks suddenly became an event when one would happen, people started asking questions about like, well, why, you know, how old do sharks get? Where do they go? Where do they travel? And it really, it spawned the whole field of shark research. Now, this was already going on in South Africa. And a lot of the reason it started in South Africa was because of, because of the frequency of shark attacks that used to occur. In fact, in, as some of you know, like in there was a, a time in 1959 when there was like, I think seven shark attacks in five days on the KZN coast. 
Um, and certainly that led to the shark attack, led to a lot of the shark research that Ori did later on. Well, in globally, what the movie Jaws did is it sparked a lot of interest in sharks. And I was kind of fortunate to be kind of that first sort of wave of young researchers um, to, that got really interested and wanted to go pursue sharks. And so as I went along and so I got so so I went up and I actually talked to Greg about trying to get into grad school and you know, I didn't have great Greg's I didn't have great great grades at the time and as I was kind of finishing up my interview with Greg I kind of asked him I said you know what are my chances of getting in to grad school and he kind of sat back in his chair and he goes oh you know Dave don't worry getting in is not your problem getting out is going to be your problem and I kind of like okay but I didn't take that I took that in a positive light and because Greg was giving me a chance, you know, and, and that's and in life, that's all you can really ask of anybody is a chance. What you do with that chance is really it's up to you. And so I had my chance and now and so and then going to grad school for my master's turned out to be the best decision I ever made. So because as I went along doing my my master's degree, I met a fella because I, I was working in San Francisco Bay and I worked on six and seven gill sharks. Well, one of the guys I met who was at the Tiburon Marine Lab, which is just across from, San, from uh, San, the city of San Francisco across the Golden Gate, was a fellow named Leonard Campagno. Now, many of you in the shark field know who I'm talking about. Um, and Leonard was very well known. He's one of, the, one of the lead shark researchers at the time. And Leonard, for those of you who don't know, he's from San Francisco originally, and he did his PhD at um, Stanford University. And when I first met him, he was working on the Sharks of the World, the FAO publication that came out in 1984. And so I got to know Leonard and we got to become friends during the time and he was like a wealth of information during that, during that time. And so I went on as I was finishing up my degree, Leonard took a job offer at the JLB Smith Institute of Ichthyology, which is now SIAB. And so I went to see Leonard before he headed off and he had lunch and stuff and just caught up. And as he was leaving, as I was getting ready to leave and you know, he was gonna be heading off to South Africa, I just kind of off the top said like, well, hey, you know, you know, Leonard, if you need anybody, to carry your bags, let me know. And, you know, thinking almost, you know, nothing, it was almost a throwaway line thinking that oh, nothing will ever come of it. Well, about eight months after he left, came to South Africa, he, he called me up and said, hey, Dave, I have a PhD bursary here. If you like it, it's yours. And it took me like a nanosecond to say yes. And here I was after all these years, my basic childhood dream or vision of traveling the world and studying sharks and making some money was coming to fruition. And off I went. And, and over the next four years, I had the most amazing time in South Africa. And I know a number of you are listening today and will recognize this guy. And this was actually the day I turned in my um, PhD dissertation to Rhodes University. And I was pretty happy, needless to say, a lot happier than that, that white shark in front of me. They coincidentally happened to some fishermen caught incidentally that day. And they, they brought in there because they knew we were, anything they caught, we'd be interested in looking at. Um, but the, the time I had there was just was an incredible experience in that, you know, not only, you know, I met some basically like lifelong friends, many are listening in today, but I also learned a lot about sharks. And I used to, they used to, and people used to joke around because with Paul Cowley and I, we used to ride around in our, my, my truck or Baki, which we called tank. And again, you, some of you know what I'm talking about. We'd, we'd go up all the way up the skeleton coast in Namibia. We went all the way up the coast in KZN and, the joke was like, I probably saw more of South Africa than, than a lot of South Africans at the time, because we just went everywhere. We seemed we were either camping on a beach or on a boat somewhere. And it was the most incredible time. And while I was doing my PhD, actually the first book I ever did with, with Leonard with Leonard and Malcolm Smale was on the sharks and rays of Southern Africa. And it was, and it was, it was a terrific experience having the opportunity to write such a book. And uh, and which is still actually the main book that people use today for identification guides. And I'm hoping one day here to be able to do an updated version of this here. I just got to convince some publishers like Stroik or someone to maybe uh, reconsider doing a new edition of this thing because it's been you know, over 30 years now and a lot's changed since then. But from the this, from this, from this start in South Africa, it's led me to, to basically pursue the dream I always wanted to do. I've I've traveled all over the world. I've been to, you know, on six continents, over 35 countries. And I go to a lot of places like, you know, uh, Wallin, Taiwan, and, and places most people have never heard of. Just, again, looking for these different types of sharks. And I get excited, like, to be able to still, and I still get excited now to be able to pick up my passport and go off and travel somewhere. It's really exciting. And as I mentioned, 
you know, I, I just did, I published my first book. I co-authored when I was a student um, in South Africa. And now I'm kind of happy to announce um, that my next two books actually uh, will be coming out here in the next few months. And the one is The Sharks of the World, which will be coming out, um, which many of you are aware of because you've heard me agonizing on it um, over the last year on The Sharks of the World. This is going to be a new edition that'll be out, be out in Europe in June and in the US and Canada in July. But I'm, but I'm showing you today, which is I haven't shared with anybody yet. This was a bit of a tease I had on, on social media, was the pocket guide to the sharks of the world, uh, which will also be out in July this year. And this, will be, this book will be distributed by a Random House, a strike publisher out of Cape Town. And so uh, keep, stay, stay tuned. There'll be more information coming on this. But I'm kind of excited um, to have my basically my 30th and 31st books now coming out. And this all started from just a stream I had and, ha and having an opportunity to, to go to South Africa and just have an amazing, amazing experience. So I've told you a little bit how I got there. And I want to just kind of, so I want to share with you some ideas, some things I've learned along sort of my path and my journey in life on how you, on things that, that, that might help you, just some things, particularly I'm talking more to some of the younger people here as you kind of set off on your journey in life. And these are just some, might seem like some general statements, but they really are, are, are true and can be helpful to whichever way, you, whichever path you choose in life. One of the things is to work hard. You know, you want to work smart, but you've got to work hard. You, you know, I get up early every morning, I'm working, I'm checking what emails might be coming in, if somebody has a new shark they want me to look at, you know, and part of it is, you know, life's competitive, no matter what field you're into, whether you're sharks or business or whatever, if you want to get to the top there, if you want to be, be in, in, in among the better people in your field, you need to work at it. And, and so a lot of it's about, you know, about knowledge and preparation. So it's one of the things I just want to impart, you need to, you need to, you need to work at it. Another thing, the thing is, we think about successful people in different professions. And, and for example, you look like a Walt Disney or Michael Jordan or JK Rowling, is they all have something in common, is that, you know, they don't fear failure. And in fact, they rather see failure as, a, as, a, as just a step on the path to success. I mean, because if, if you let failure get in the way or your fear of it, you'll guarantee you won't, you won't succeed. And you look at somebody like a, a Michael Jordan, you know, got cut from his high school basketball team. He went on and had a pretty good basketball career. You know, Walt Disney, who, who you know, got fired from a job because, he, you know, he didn't have any imagination. Of course, now you have the, the, the Disney Corporation, you know, or J.K. Rowling, who had rejected from numerous publishers. And an article I read, she said, you know, getting rejected was actually liberating for her because she was able to go out and pursue what she wanted to and write with the way she wanted to. So, you know, you're going to have setbacks in life and you can spend a whole hour talking. I could, I could spend a whole hour doing it. And, and which, which leads me to another point that if you talk to people that are successful, kind of whether in your sphere or within your network, you know, a lot of times they'll tell you, they'll go on about all the, uh, 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 failures they've had. And you're thinking like, well, well I want to know how you succeeded. And, and they're they actually, they are telling you how su they succeeded by what they learned from their failures. So, you know, don't fear failure because you're guaranteed if you don't get out there and try, you will fail. If you get out there and you try and you fail the first time, keep trying because there's always going to be that other, other more opportunities to come along. And the third thing and I've touched on this a few times today my presentation is that, you know, it's about the, you know, be good to people, you know, make friendships and stuff. And, you know, some of my best friends I have, I still have today are all, or some of you probably listening today in South Africa, you know, I mean, I, I really relish the time we had together and everything. And as I've gone on in life, I've obviously had opportunities to make, make a lot of new friends, especially I've had a number of graduate students now. Like in fact, I've had over 50 graduate students now, but I've made a lot of friends with a lot of young people and a lot of other in other places, including South Africa, Tanzania and Zanzibar and just and all over the world in Asia. And it's, it just it gets me it still gets me excited to be able to work with some of these young people and see in the lower corner here. I'm with Hamish, who I met. I mentioned earlier, I met at a fish market in Zanzibar with Rhett Bennett, who I've gotten to know in the last few years and had to have a great relationship. And and he's you know, runs the, the Southwest Indian Ocean Shark and Ray project for the Wildlife Conservation Society, and but I want to mention about one one young man who's just who's in the picture in the upper right corner there, 
Abdullah, and he works for a ret uh, in Zanzibar. And, you know, and he's in a, you know, in a situation he's in, he doesn't have a lot of opportunities to, to go out and to, to meet people in different, you know, to meet people outside, out really outside Zanzibar. But he's, he, he's very dedicated to, to doing the work, to going to the fish markets, to monitoring what's, what's occurring there, to take photographs, take tissues. And obviously, much like Hamish, you know, we had an opportunity to, to, to meet. We went to the fish markets there quite a bit. And what was, inter what was interesting, kind of, kind of interesting, or I thought was, a, was, a, was an interesting story, is that one day, you know, every day he'd be there like at 10 o'clock sharp. We'd meet, we'd go off, to the, go off to the fish markets. Well, one day, you know, he was about 10 minutes late. It's not a big deal. It's, you know, it's like 10 minutes. We got plenty of time to get to the fish markets and stuff. I wasn't worried about it. But he comes walking up to me and he starts apologizing for being late. And I was like, oh, don't, dude, don't worry about it. It's no, it's no big deal. And, and he says that, you know, he lost his phone. And I was like, oh my gosh, you lost your phone. I said, well, do you want to go? I, I, let's go. Let's see if we can find it. And he says, well, I didn't really lose it. it. Actually got stolen from me. I was like, oh man. I said, well, maybe we should go file a, like a police report, see if we can get find your phone. He said, and, and as I'm saying this, he says, well, actually, when, when I got my phone was stolen, I was actually got robbed and I got stabbed. And this guy got stabbed on his shoulder with a panga and he almost was killed uh, the night before. And he went to, he ended up spending the night in the emergency ward getting, getting stitched up and he left the hospital and he walked about six kilometers in about 43 degrees Celsius heat just so he wouldn't miss a day going to the fish market with me. And I'm like, no, dude, you need to go home and get some rest. So I put him in a cab and sent him home. I'd been to the fish market to go, no, I'd gone enough days myself, but just the dedication. And I thought about that. He puts out, he was, he was putting out to, to, to be there, to not, to not, to not, to not be late the one day. And again, for someone like him, he doesn't have a lot of opportunity to probably travel outside the country, but in his own way, he's contributing to his community by learning about, the, by providing information for the sharks and rays there that are being caught and that could be used for, you know, Tanzania's National Plan of Action for Sharks. You know, he's doing this because of something like this. This is what's called a lost shark. This is Carcharhinus obsolaris. This is actually a Southeast Asia species that was caught, uh, that was last reported in 1934. It's only known from three museum species. When this species was named in 2019, 85 years after it disappeared, by, it was named by Will White, P. Kine, and Mark Harris. This species, this species was declared extinct. And this is the kind of thing I talked about the Pondicherry shark earlier that, we, that you know, I'm we're trying to look out for, these things that are disappearing right below us. Now, this is, obviously I mentioned this is, a, this is a Southeast Asian species, but an East African species, and one that you've, you've, you've seen, and it, it used to occur in South Africa, the sawfish. Now, <clears throat> this is, now, I don't believe, uh, Abdullah has ever seen a sawfish in Zanzibar, and even these used to be common in South, in East Africa, and certainly South Africa. He may never see one in his lifetime because these things are almost an event when they're still caught. In South Africa, these things have been pretty much extirpated, and I don't think I think the most recent sighting of one from up in the St. Lucia area was 1999, 20 years ago. Somebody might correct me, but I believe it was over 20 years ago. So this thing's actually disappeared from South Africa, although South Africa is been pretty much of the has been leading and doing a lot of a lot of conservation and i say that because of something like this this is a wedge fish and this is what brought me a lot to east africa to study and, and i was going out with with abdullah and as i mentioned abdullah may never see a sawfish in his entire life his kids almost certainly will but these wedge fish are still around and south africa has been very good about uh, developing conservation plans to conserve these things you know, whereas in lots, lots of places, not just in Africa, but in other places in the world, these things are being, uh, are being fished for their fins and for their meat, and they are rapidly disappearing. This, these are some of the most critically endangered species in the world. And so the reason, you know, so the reason, like I said, Abdullah is going out and wanting to go to these fish markets and be there, you know, is that because he's on his journey, you know, he's, you know, he's, you know, I talked earlier about, you know, if you want to have a life of, you know, pursue a path that's either going to be that of an explorer or a settler and what path you choose in life. And for me, you know, I chose my paths many decades ago, the path I want to choose on. And my young friend Abdullah, he's chosen his path that he's pursuing in life, one that he hopes can make a difference for his community. And so the young people out there today listening to this, and decide which way you want to go. The question I'll leave with you is, do you want to be an explorer or a settler? 
the path you want to choose is really yours and whichever path you choose, it'll be, it'll be the right one. But I just want to close by saying, you know, whatever journey you choose, whatever path you choose, it's yours to choose and yours alone. And I just want to wish you all good luck on your journey. I hope each of you finds more than you're looking for as you search for your own lost sharks in life. And anyway, thanks again for everyone coming today. I want to thank you and thank everyone and happy trails. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. And just want to thank some of the sponsors. Uh, SIAB has been a terrific sponsor and her supporter, partner in the Lost Sharks Project, SciFest Africa for co-hosting today, uh, Save Our Seas Foundation and the Wild Oceans have been tremendous supporters in this Lost Sharks program. And finally, I just want to acknowledge Sabine Wintner and Pete Kine, um, my co-authors on the checklist paper that was just published. And just over Pete's shoulder there, that's Rob Leslie. They were out birding from day and I don't know these crazy bird guys, who knows? So anyway, thanks very much. So. Hi, Dave. Thank you very, very much. It was a terrific, uh, terrifically interesting talk. Um, I've learned a lot already. Um, there are a few questions. Um, the first one I have is from Marcel de Villiers um, and, and that is, are our sharks on the endangered species lists and are they beginning, are they becoming extinct due to overfishing? Um, it's, it's, it's a broad question. It's really, it, it, it's, it depends on the species, the ones you look at. As I mentioned, well, I just mentioned a sawfish, for example. I don't believe one's been seen in South Africa since 1999. And they used to, there are records down to Port Alfred, I believe, and they used to occur up around the St. Lucia area back in the 50s and 60s. So, and so within South Africa, that's an example of a species that's been disappearing. Some of the species, they may be more common than we realize, but just nobody either recognizes them or has, has observed them. And it's really, you know, we try, and, and in the paper I just did, if you go through there, we list like the current IUCN red list assessment, whether it's least concerned, data deficient or critically endangered. And so there are some species that should probably be paid attention to the the uh, shy sharks are a good example. They only occur in South Africa and nowhere else in the world. And so if they go ex disappear there, they'll be gone for good. So. Thanks. Okay, so an another question from Marcel and then a similar question from uh, Chris Fallows. How mm -hmm. can the public assist in protecting their habitats? And Chris asks, uh, do you think, what do you think the biggest threats are facing the sharks in South Africa? And what would your, be, your suggestion be to rectify this? Well, again, I think South Africa has done a better job in general, but you know, uh, coastal development, the coastal species are particularly vulnerable for any kind of coastal development or intense fisheries. Are there, are there really you know, intense coastal artisanal fisheries are really the main concerns I have in South Africa. As, as I use the example in um, Sri Lanka, where there was this entire fish, there was an entire fishery going on for squalene oil and nobody, nobody knew about it. None of the NGOs, the government, it was just going, taking place. And so that's the kind of thing to see what's going, you know, if there's some fisheries that are, people are unaware of, or there's some intense fisheries taking place that people don't know about, um, would be the, be the best thing. And then it's almost on a, you know, again, you have to look them almost on a species specific thing versus you can, when you say sharks, you know, you're talking about everything from like a small velvet dog shark to a white shark. So looking at some of the individual species, and as I, I mentioned, like the wedge fish and some of the rays, and these, this is again why I use the term flat shark. Some of the rays like the wedge fish are, are probably one of the most critically endangered groups of sharks in the world. And that includes South Africa. And so if there's, there's a good example of a, of a group that should be, should, a lot of attention should be paid to so they don't disappear. Okay, so I have from Reet Leipold, um, how big is the, bear, uh, the Barry's lantern shark? Uh, it gets about, it's not a big shark, it's about 40 centimeters. Okay, and that's for the, the whole group, all of the lantern sharks? No, no, the, some of the lantern sharks will get, there's a couple that'll get up towards a meter in length. Uh, there's actually one that occurs off South Africa, it's called a Southern lantern shark. That gets up to about, almost a meter in length, 100 centimeters. Okay, cool. Um, from Elizabeth Gray, is it possible we may still find some of these missing sharks, like rediscovering the coelacanth? 
uh, yes, it's it, a lot of times uh, there have been some species uh, that we've found that we thought I don't want to. I hate to use the term extinct. And it was a big it was a big deal when they described this lost shark to declare a marine species extinct. But sometimes you know, but they, they really couldn't find any more records of this thing. Um, a lot of times it's a matter of looking for it. And so, and, and a lot of times people, things that I thought were extinct or extirpated, it's just a matter of actually going and looking in some of the areas where, where, where you, you wanna look. And a good example I'll use is um, last year I did, a, I did this TV show for Shark Week. And one of the species we went to look for was, was called a white tip weasel shark. Now this species, this is kind of an interesting story. This species was actually caught by Malcolm Smale off Cozy Bay in about 20 meters in 1984. And him and Leonard Campagno described it in 1985. And since then, there have been no records of this species. And it's a small coastal species. And so you kind of start wondering, is this thing still around? Well, there was a, uh, well, on a cruise off Southern Mozambique, um, Phil and Elaine Heemster actually got a specimen. And, and to my knowledge, this was the only one known until I was doing this TV show last year. And this, and it, it sounds funny, but I tell you, I've, ha I've had some really good luck doing these different shows because the ones I do, they usually want me to go look for some shark that nobody's seen in a long time. And so along that experience, I talked to Bruce Mann, I talked to a whole bunch of people and everybody's like, oh, we never seen this thing. Well, it turns out Rob Kyle, who might be on here today, who grew up in the Cozy Bay area, he says, oh, I've caught like 20 of those things around Cozy and Sodwana. And then as they started looking into it more, we found there's, if you go to some of the fishing places around Sodwana, there's people holding pictures of these things. So this is an example of a, of a shark that we had not seen since 1984, that just because we went and looked for this thing and I got to know somebody like Rob just thought this thing was a, a boring shark he hates to catch and he's caught like a whole bunch of them. So, um, so anyway, it's like a lot of times it's just a matter of going and looking for them. And again, this gets into talking to people as well. So. Yes, I remember a, a few years ago, uh, Alan Whitfield published a paper uh, I think in environmental biology of fishes, where he he described the um, one of the pipe fishes in the Eastern Cape estuaries as, as being extinct, and mm -hmm. literally the next year it, he got a whole load of records. So, and, and I look at that as a good thing. You, you hate you hate that's actually a situation where you don't mind being wrong. If you're if, yep. you, if you if you said it extinct, then you're like, hey, we found some, but it brings awareness. And I I didn't want to talk. I didn't couldn't share it today. And I but I but in July there's going to be a there was, a, there was a species of ray in the Northern Indian Ocean that we were actually getting ready to declare extinct. And we found some. And my colleague Rima Jabata uh, and some student of hers found some of these things. And I'll leave it at that, but there'll be some announcements coming out in July. We have a paper coming out in this thing. It was a pretty, that was a pretty amazing story as well. But again, a lot of times it's just looking and talking to people. So. Yeah, good, so there is hope. Yes. Um, this is a comment, so more than a question, but it's from Elizabeth, Elizabeth uh, Codalupi. I hope I've got that pronunciation correct. An interesting fact in, Ma in Madagascar, whale sharks are called Marikintana, which means starry sky because of their pattern. Yeah, well, that's interesting. I had, ne I had not heard that term before. I, I, um, if, I could, if I could share, if I could share, if I could share, I'll share another little in Taiwan in 2005. In fact, it was the Indo-Pacific Fish Conference. And I'd spent a lot of time in Taiwan. I first went there in 1988 on a fellowship while I was a grad student in South Africa. And that's a whole other amazing time I had. But at, at the bank, at, at the going away bank with the last night, they were serving um, tofu shark. And, uh, or they're actually, they're just, they recall, yeah, they're calling it tofu. And so, and I knew what they were talking about tofu shark. And if you don't know, in Taiwan, tofu shark is whale shark. And so there's a whole bunch of people, a bunch of conservation types, and they're just chowing down like, wow, this is kind of cool stuff. What is it? Is it most tofu shark? <laughs> oh, and they're thinking it's, a, it's tofu. And then they find out it actually they're eating whale shark. So, so it's okay. Well, I, I had a question. Okay, well, I, I um, had a question. Okay. Which uh, also relates to whale sharks. Recently, we had uh, two or three whale sharks wash up on the Cannon Rocks, Port Alfred section of coastline in South Africa. Um, I think the one that we found was about five or six meters. I think there were other smaller specimens. Um, what was happening there, Dave? Do you have any ideas? 
No, I don't. I, I can't tell you. It, it, it's interesting when you have a couple, you know, one might be all that sort of interesting to die, but when you have, you say you had a few of them wash up, boy, I have no idea. Sometimes, I know some of the things, sometimes species get caught in offshore gillnet fisheries, drift gillnet fisheries, and they die out there and they're just, and the fishermen don't want them, so they just throw them back and they wash up. And I know, I know with the mega mouth shark, I've come to find out that a lot of times when they wash, because most of the time the ones you find have washed up on the beach. Well, I've come to realize that they get caught in offshore drift gillnet fisheries. They die in the nets and the guys just throw them back and sometimes they'll wash up in the beach. So it's possible these things got caught in, a, in, a, in an offshore fishery and they were just discarded and they washed up. Hmm. So this that, is another comment any, from, uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, Rob, I say, Roger, one other thing, if you have any uh, fish pathologists there, and I'm not sure who, who's doing that, that'd be something for they could see if there's any type of uh, diseases they may have had as well. That's a relatively unex unstudied area. Yeah, okay. Um, this is a comment from Philip uh, Mechanic. Uh, bears have a better PR despite killing more people than sharks. Shouldn't we make cuddly toy sharks? <laughs> 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 I think sharks are cuddly anyway. Um, no, I think I think a lot of it is just it comes down to the communication with them and how you phrase things. Um, yeah, I mean you're right. You can go through the whole. They always have the things like you know the bears and other wildlife. You know certainly do a lot more damage to people than sharks. Um, but I think part of it's just being in the water and that sort of mystery. Not you know I can't I can't really explain it. You know it's, I think I think a lot of it comes from people that are not in the water a lot. If you talk with people like in bear country, a lot of times they just, oh, well, it's, it's there. You talk to people that surf or dive a lot. It's like, well, you know, I might see a shark. I might not. No. Yeah. Um, this is from Oren Judah. Uh, to secure conservation efforts and gains for these sharks, what data do we need to know, collect about them? Well, first we need to identify them correctly. That's the first thing you need to do. And then, and then to, to be able to document them. And then if you have um, then anything, and then anything you can, you can find out about them, like things like just what's their range, what do they occur on? I, you know, I mentioned like the six gill saw shark, when it has a range from say South Africa to Tanzania, that's a fairly wide area, uh, you know, but when you find out like this thing might only occur in South Africa and maybe Southern Mozambique, you're, view of it from a conservation standpoint is going to change because it has a more limited distribution. So learning things simple like identification, which is huge. That's one of the real critical things to be able to identify them, the range of them, and then any kind of uh, life history information you can get on them. And a lot of times I'll go to fish markets because they'll bring in things that, you know, normally I'm not going to go out and try and catch a whole bunch of them, but, if, but you'll find fishers are bringing them in and you should use that as an opportunity to try to learn something about what they feed on, what's their maturity status, What's the age these things are at? Because that's all going to be important information for developing proper conservation uh, policy. Thanks. Uh, Roy Lubke has a question about the, the image that you showed of the ghost shark. Uh, there were two things on the ghost shark's rear end. They, were they seemed to be sticking out of the anus. What, what were those? Those are the <laughs> claspers. And... Uh, on, on sharks and rays and ghost sharks, they have what are called, uh, they're basically it's the sex organs on, on the sharks. They have, it's, it's what they use for copulation, but you see that that tells you it's a male, it's a male of the species. Okay. Um, I'm getting down the list. Uh, I've, got another, I've got another question whilst I read these others. Um, why, is, why do you think uh, the diversity in Southern Africa is so high compared to the rest of the world? Um, I think part of it is, has to do with the two oceans. You have the warm Agullis coming down the East Coast and you have the cold Benguela on the, on the West Coast. And I think it's that combination of, uh, of, of, of currents that, that gives, gives a wide diversity of things. You're getting, you're getting these, these, two, these two environments. A lot of places you'll have one or the other. And, uh, and I, I meant to mention too, if anybody's interested, um, I did a paper about six years ago in 2015, an African Journal of Marine Science that I talk, I get into more about the, the two oceans currents. I, I get more into, a little more into the history and some of the people in, uh, in South African uh, uh, research. And if you can either get a copy through uh, my ResearchGate profile um, or you can, you can direct message me 
or you can contact SIAB or something. We can get you a copy. I can send you a PDF if you're interested to find out more, a lot more detail about this. Okay, thanks. Um, so I've got another question from an, an anonymous person. Uh, is there a massive six guild, very deep sea shark off the coast of Australia? I saw pictures of it many years ago in an old whaling station uh, in Albany, Western Australia. It was truly massive. It was only seen when they tied up the whales out in the bay before dragging them ashore. And the sharks would come and feed on the whale carcasses. Hmm. And that's how that's that's they used to have the same thing happen off Durban when they'd haul in the whales. They used to get these massive white sharks would follow in the whales and stuff. And they would there used to be a group of fishers there. Um, Eleanor Bullen used to tell me the stories. I think her father was one of them. Um, she's another person that's really fascinating to talk about. But they used to have the thousand pound club where they would fish these white sharks off the beach. This was back in the 50s uh, and 60s. Um, but to answer your question is, yeah, there's a, there's a large six gill shark. It's called a blunt nose six gill. And it's actually it's one's kind of near and dear to me. It's this scientific name, Texancus griseus. And it's, it's one of the two species I started my career on in California studying that and the uh, uh, broad nose uh, 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 seven gill shark, Notorhynchus. Those are the two species I worked on for my masters. And when I went to South Africa, I continued working on those species. And this, the six gill shark, that particular species gets up to about five and a half meters. There's a few records of it getting up to six meters. I can't, I can't confirm those, but five to five and a half meter, they definitely get up to about that size. So, and I have found, and I have found whale, whale remains in their stomach, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is from Judy Mann. Um, so if we keep hey, discovering more specimens of these lost sharks, how do we ensure that the IUCN listings are accurate? Um, I, well, I'm on the IUCN. I'm the taxonomic chair, or where I was. I kind of just recently passed over to Simon Vagman now, but I'm one of the people they come to to verify the identification of stuff when they have new things to um, to 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 assess and stuff. So I'm pretty. I've been pretty involved with that for the last 20 years. I'm kind of right now we're transitioning to get some of the younger people involved in this stuff. Um, and actually, Rima Jabata just took over as the uh, chair for the whole IUCN shark specialist group. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're on that, we're on that. Yes, yeah, so certainly from a freshwater, um, African freshwater uh, red listing, that, that's done every 10 years, uh, but also you can update it at any stage uh, if you have new information. So it's pretty much live. Right, yeah, I mean, it, they do it every, yeah, we just finished going through all the shark stuff uh, Nick Dalvey and Colin Simpador were the co-chairs the last four years. They just stepped down at the end of the year, but they, part of the big project was to get all these things reassessed. And as new things, like I showed you, the, well, I talked about this one new shark coming out. It'll be, a, it'll be a, once it's formally published, it'll, it'll be assessed shortly. So, um, so we're, we're on that. Um, Peter Kunert asks, how many sharks are killed annually for shark fin soup and oil. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's here's something that if you know there's there, they, you see a lot of numbers thrown around, but they figure the average numbers, you know, it's probably on the upper side, it's probably around 73 million sharks a year. And um, interestingly, shark fin has gotten a lot. Shark finning has gotten a lot more attention in the last 20 years. A lot of it had to do with Shelley Clark publishing some papers showing that the range could any, be anywhere from 20 million to maybe 73 million uh, uh, sharks are killed a year. Well, here's something that not people may not be aware of, but this book I did in 1989 with Leonard and Malcolm, you see our picture there on the back. If you look in the back of the book, we actually calculated the approximate number of sharks that were taken a year. And this is again, in the 1980s and most of the 90s, nobody paid any attention to shark fins. You'd see them around there. I used to see them collect, you know, people come around and, and get, take them in, in back when I was in South Africa, but nobody really paid attention to them. We happened to calculate out that number. And surprisingly, it came out almost identical to what Shelley determined uh, 14 years later. So if you want to, from a historical standpoint, the first sort of calculation on the number of sharks that were taken in the finning industry, you can look in this 1989 book I did 
on the sharks and rays of Southern Africa. And uh, it's in the back of the book. I can't remember the exact page number, but if I can add to Roger, one thing as well is like, when we started, when I, and I certainly when I was in South Africa, shark conservation wasn't even a thing then. It really didn't come into being until the 1990s, kind of after the protect, some of the protections for white sharks came into being that really, when we started, there was no such thing as shark conservation. It was just something we were aware of, but there was really no, nothing had really started yet. So that field is really about 30 years old, maybe, if that, in terms of shark conservation. No, I mean, nobody, some of you there know me, knew me back then. I mean, it wasn't anything you really talked about. It was always more from a fishery standpoint. Um, I did have a question and it seems to have disappeared now, but it was also on shark fins. Uh, soup. What are the species that are, that are killed primarily for shark fin soup? Um, it depends. It really depends. There's a lot of, uh, it depends what part of the world you're on. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll you know, things that are, have a lot of value or think or some of the ones that have a lot of fins are oceanic white tips and silkies, which are very caught quite a bit in the open ocean, blue sharks, um, those species actually be ha, actually you're fairly fecund on the blue sharks and reproduce quickly. It really depends on the part of the world you're on. Um, one of the critical things I mentioned about the soft fish and the wedge fish is the fins in those things are actually worth more than the meat. And in fact, where whereas people would catch them in some of the artisanal fisheries just for the meat, people came in, you know, particularly from Asia and, and started paying a lot more money for the fins and then really weren't as worried about the meat. And so you actually developed a targeted fishery for the fins because there were so much, you know, it's a lot of these small villages and stuff. I mean, you get a few soft fish or these wedge fish, um, you can, you can, you can, you know, people pay a lot of money for them. And so suddenly they become more of a targeted, targeted fishery. Uh, this is from Melissa Demiao. Uh, has there always been a massive phobia of sharks in the general public, or has it only sprung up recently? You know, I, I, well, I, I, I think I think a lot of the phobia today is more more amongst people that study sharks than than the public. And I say that because again, going back to when Jaws before Jaws came out, again, I'm in California, so my the perspective may be a little different from the South Africans that have been around that remember some of the shark attacks at the time. But I mean, there'd be shark attacks around Monterey Bay once in a while, and just it was never a big deal. After Jaws, it became more of an event. But that kind of, and so there, so shark attacks became kind of a big thing. And I don't know if I'd call it a phobia, but as I say, what really that whole thing spawned was after you got past the initial hype of a shark attack, if people wanted to start knowing more about the sharks. And so I, I, I think a lot of times the phobia is overblown. The media certainly is, it, it helps drive a lot of that narrative as well. Um, but I think a lot of times, you know, again, if you're someone who's in the water a lot, it's more people that come in from the interior. They're not around the ocean. It might would probably have more of a bit of a phobia because they're just not used to being around the water. So I don't know if that a a answered your question exactly, but it just, it just it's, it's a matter of perception. So uh, this is I mean, from... I, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say that, you know, like down in Monterey Bay where people, there's, you know, it's a big surfing area. People, you know, I used to do a lot of spear fishing when I was younger. I go, up, I go up now in helicopters to give you an idea, like to survey white sharks there in the bay. And there's like a two mile stretch of beach. It's one of the most popular beaches around Mon in Monterey Bay. I'll count 30, 40 white sharks within a two mile stretch of beach. And they are literally just in back of the surf line. And people are sitting on the beach or kids are playing in the surf, boogie boarding. They have no idea there's like 30 sharks sitting right in back of them, white sharks, and they're just cruising. And, you know, you, you let people know those, the lifeguards will put up a notice if there's a, if there's a lot, if there's, if they seem a little active, but during the day, the sharks are just hanging out there. And it just kind of, I, and I, I, when I, my, when I have an opportunity to be on the news or some talk about it, I just say like the sharks aren't hunting yet. They're there. You know, if you see one, well, you know, it's like, wow, great. I saw one. But your chances are you're not going to see one. You, know, you only see them when you're up high. But um, anyway, that's the kind of stuff I think helps allay people's fears of, of sharks. But that kind of a positive thing. David, this is from me. But um, do we have um, do, do you have shark netting in 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 America? No, no. Really I mean, the beaches really aren't. 
The only place I know that has shark netting is in, in, in Australia that I know of, South Africa. The thing in South Africa, and again, you know, I don't know if Jeremy or Sheldon are listening today, they could give you a better answer, but you know, when you go up the KZN coastline, you have all these rivers emptying into the ocean and bull sharks or Zambezi sharks, they like to go up rivers. And of course you have a lot of good surf breaks and popular beaches around river mouths. And so it's not a good combination where you have these, these, these habitats that are really conducive to Zambezi sharks, which also happen to be popular areas to surf and to swim. And probably the Zambezi sharks probably cause more shark attacks in South Africa than any other shark. Um, again, I, uh, if Jeremy or Sheldon are, are on there today, they could probably tell you for sure. But, uh, but from, our, from what my research years ago, see, that seemed to be the most common species was the Zambezis. But you have a bad situation where you have good habitat for Zambezis and a good habitat for people. It's just not a good mix. Yep. This is from uh, El Eloisa Guerretta. Uh, do you think there's an efficient method to find the lost sharks? Uh, I kind of told you, <laughs> I find there's no, everyone's gonna pose a different situation. You just, you know, and a lot of it's just going to areas where they've been seen, talking to people and uh, trying to take, you know, the other thing I do too is when I go to the fish marks, I keep track, I keep a little notebook with me and I write down everything I see. And nowadays I photograph everything, you know, 30 years ago, we didn't have digital cameras. So every picture you would take, you know, cost you money. So you, you had to be a little more concerned about how many pictures you took. Nowadays with digital cameras, you just snap off all the pictures you can. Um, but I, it's always good to document what you see because sometimes you might, there, there may be known species that are considered lost sharks that people didn't even know occurred there. So. Yeah. This is from Dave, oh, I lost it. This is from David Burn. Burn how many shark species are known to date in the world? Actual, well, the book I have coming out is there's 536 species in that book, and there's about four species that have just that have come out or there are coming out, include berry shark, and there's about four, so about 540 or so species in the world right now that are known of just the sharks. Okay. Um, this is from Elizabeth Gray. What books or papers would you recommend for an interested civilian who loves sharks to, and to read and educate themselves? Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of good good books around there. I mean, if you want to that paper I mentioned on the uh, uh, which is actually also called Rediscovering the Lost Sharks of Southern Africa, there has a bit of history. It's not it's not a real heavy technical read. Um, that's a, that's a good paper just if you want to learn about South African stuff. There's several books that are sort of general out there. I can I can send you a list if you guys you, if you want to post. I could just send you a list of a few just general shark books that are not too too heavy for a non technical person. Um, there's actually this book I mentioned earlier that I did in 1989. There's actually a lot of just good information. It's a good general reading. A lot of the stuff in there is still applicable today. A lot of the general information. And that's probably available through South African secondhand bookstores, I would imagine. Yeah, so it's been out of print for a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, there'll be a, the the big book I have coming out. There'll be a lot of there's a lot of really good information in there. I'm just not sure what the price break is going to be for South Africa for the big book. The smaller one, I think, will be much will be probably more affordable. But the big one, I'm not sure what the cost is going to be yet. Um, I've got two questions from MetaV. Um, I'm not going to be able to pronounce your surname. I apologize. Uh, will the new edition of, of the Sharks of the World be available in Asia? Yes. Yeah. Should be. I yeah. don't know. I don't know the dates they'll be available, but yes, it will be available. All right. Also from Meta V, uh, what do you think about the trend of shark populations based on your experience in monitoring and landings? I think in, in some cases, again, that's kind of a general, it's a broad um, broad statement because you can the general response is like well all, all shark populations are collapsing and that's not true there are actually some shark species that are actually sustainable uh, they grow fairly they grow relatively quickly and they have a lot of young uh, some of the hound sharks the genus musculus or some of those species are but you get into some of the things like dusky sharks and some of the and, and species like 
like that that tend to be very they're slower growing you know duskies you can wipe out in certain areas you know there's a lot of concern over oceanic white tips so it kind of depends on a species a species specific on which ones but as a general rule a lot of the carcharhinus species a lot of the requiem sharks tend to be more vulnerable than some of the like say the hounds things like the hound shark group This is from Paul Cager. Uh, apart from the bull and Zambezi sharks, are there any species of shark that are primarily freshwater species? Yeah, there's a whole, in South Africa, that's the main, that's the main species there. But globally in, in Indonesia and Northern Australia, you have what are called, there's a group of, of sharks called river sharks. The genus is Glyphus. And we don't know very much about them at all. And they are mainly known from rivers. Um, they're known from also they're known from India, Northern Australia, Papua New Guinea, and Indonesia, and they literally they're mostly known known just from rivers. They're they're I don't think they're I think they do occasionally move into into the marine environment, but they're mostly they mostly occur just just in the in the marine in the marine uh, in, in, or excuse me in, in a freshwater environment. I have uh, another question from Marcel de Villiers. Um, where the met Ask whether megalodons do they still exist in our oceans? Um, no, <laughs> that's, that's the easiest way I can describe it. Outside movies and um, and uh, 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 do, what do they call it? Uh, fake documentaries. There, no, there's no, there's no evidence. Of, no, no, <laughs> there's uh, no. The thing, the thing, uh, interesting thing with with the, the megalodon. And why they went extinct was the whales they used to feed on, which was their primary diet. The whales went extinct. Their primary food went extinct. And, the, and you, they can track this in the fossil record. The megalodon went extinct right after. And then you had things like the white, the newer whales that evolved. Um, as they evolved, you had things like white, uh, modern white sharks start to evolve. But basically megalodon, its food disappeared. So it disappeared. Huh. Okay. Um, this is from Jess Robertson. Is citizen science part of your research? And do you think it's important for shark conservation? Yeah, well, as I, I mentioned, a lot of the people I, I talk about citizen science, again, it's a little bit of a broad, but yeah, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, a lot of the fishermen I talk to at markets and stuff, they're just citizens, citizens, and, they're, and they do, they're some of the best science, citizen scientists I, I've ever had a chance to uh, work with and stuff, because they're, they're out there in the water every day, all year long. But there are other projects that like, for example, we have a program here in California called Spot a Basking Shark. And that we get used to get basking sharks used to be relatively common here. And they seem to be kind of cyclic where there'll be years you'll see a lot of them and some years you won't see them. And so we have the public, we just, we put out in the media that if you see a basking shark, if you can take a picture of it and send it to us, then we can, we can document its occurrence here in California. So that's another example of a citizen science type of project. Dave, I've um, I've come to the end of questions, I believe. Oh, cool! Well, it's been a great, it's like some really cool questions. I really appreciate it. That's that's great. And I can't again. I just I can't tell you. I just, it's such a, a an honor, a pleasure for me to be able to speak to a South African audi audience like this. And hopefully, if I do this again sometime, I can actually do it in person. Maybe at Syab or someplace, and and actually connect with the audience, be able to see the audience there, and see everyone there. See a lot of good friends as well. No. We're looking forward to having you back in South Africa. That's for sure. Great. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Dave, thank you very much again. Yeah. Thank you. All right. <clears throat>